Augmentation in restless leg syndrome can be difficult to manage and actually occurs relatively commonly. So I hope to be able to explain to you an approach that can be used to both minimise the risk of augmentation and help manage symptoms when they occur. So augmentations when people who are on long-term treatment with dopaminergic agonists develop a worsening in their restless leg symptoms. It was first described in 1996 and at that point was felt that about 75% of people on levodopa or other short-term dopamine agonists would go on to develop augmentation. In the years since, when it's been more systematically studied, it appears that around 8% of people on long-term dopamine agonists develop augmentation. The common symptoms that people describe uh, which actually characterise augmentation, is not just a worsening or greater intensity of symptoms. It's finding that symptoms occur earlier in the day, so that can be two to four hours earlier than they were previously coming on. It takes shorter for symptoms to come on after sitting down or beginning to rest. Symptoms occur in other parts of the body, so spread up the legs, into the arms, into the trunk. And drugs seem to have a shorter duration of effect and aren't as effective for as long a period. Based on that, the International Restless Leg Syndrome study groups developed some questions that can be used in a clinical sense to screen for augmentation that go along the lines of the common symptoms that people describe. So these are four clinical questions that can be used, and again asking about do the symptoms appear earlier, are higher doses of the drug now needed, has the intensity of symptoms worsened, and have symptoms spread to other parts of the body. So when we're starting people on treatment for restless leg syndrome, that's really the time to think about minimising the future risk of augmentation. So it's important to look at non-drug strategies in managing restless leg symptoms before any, using any prescription medication. So making sure iron stores are adequate, looking at strategies such as massage or pacing or movement as a way of managing people's symptoms. In the US, there's an FDA-approved device that actually massages the calves and does produce symptomatic improvement in restless leg symptoms, but that's not available in Australia. If people do need a medication, then it's thinking about not necessarily starting them on a dopamine agonist, but looking at other families of medications, such as the alpha-2 delta ligands, like gabapentin, pregabalin, or enacarbral that's available in other markets. If people do need a dopamine agonist because they don't respond to, for example, alpha-2 delta ligands, are then trying to minimise the dose and duration of exposure to dopamine agonists. There's some thought, but not great evidence, that using a long-acting dopamine agonist lowers the risk. And the evidence for this, or the thoughts around this, is that levodopa seems to have the highest risk of augmentation, and the longest acting of the dopamine agonists, rotigotine, seems to have the lowest risk of augmentation. And that sort of leads this uh, thinking in that regard. If someone's already got augmentation and it's developed, then my approach is generally to ensure that people's iron stores are adequate. Sometimes augmentation can develop in people who are actually stable on dopamine agonists, but get low iron stores, which exacerbates their restless leg symptoms. If augmentation is relatively mild, I won't necessarily switch people off dopamine agonists. I might even temporarily increase the dose. Really, you get a sense that if they're beginning to develop augmentation, I'm going to have to switch them off the drug at some point. But if they're really difficult to control and they're actually not doing too badly, temporarily increasing the dose at least buys more time before they have to switch off the drug. Another alternative is splitting the dose of the dopamine agonist so that they're on a lower dose at two time points, or getting them to take the dopamine agonist a little earlier. If people don't respond to that strategy or have got more severe symptoms, they do need to switch from the dopamine agonist to something else. The aim is to really get people off dopamine agonist, but it's not always possible. So I'll end up uh, reducing the dose of dopamine agonist if I can't switch them completely to something else and will sometimes actually switch to a different dopamine agonist, but really the only one I'd switch to is rotigotine because of its longer duration of action and therefore reduce propensity, or at least thought reduced propensity, for developing augmentation. This is also a group where I'll consider a high potency opioid as a bridge so that people might be on an opioid for a couple of months while they're off the dopamine agonist, letting things settle and eventually rotating back to going onto a dopamine agonist again. 
So augmentation is a worsening of symptoms that comes about as a consequence of long-term treatment with dopamine agonists. So to minimise augmentation, it's important to use the minimum effective dose and duration of treatment with dopamine agonists that we can possibly manage. If augmentation does develop, eventually you are going to need to switch the patient to something else, such as one of the alpha-2 delta ligands, a longer-acting dopamine agonist such as rotigotine, or a high-potency opioid, or even often find in severe patients a combination of two or even three of these agents. Just because someone develops augmentation doesn't mean they can't ever go back onto dopamine agonists, and often it's a case of just giving them a break from the dopamine agonist for a period of time, I usually try for a couple of months, and then they find they can usually get back to the dopamine agonist and again be successfully treated with it for quite a long period. For the A to Z of sleeping well, head to the hub, sleephub.com.au.